Hi, it's Katrina, Jason, and the Golden Fleece. Scientists in the country of Georgia recently discovered evidence that could confirm the reality behind one of the most famous myths in Greek history. This is the story of Jason and the Golden Fleece. Jason was a mythical Greek hero, first mentioned sometime around the year 300 BC. According to the legend, Jason united a group of similar heroes known as the Argonauts to go through a series of difficult trials. These trials included things like fighting harpies and giants, but the main trial was finding the Ram of Zeus, which had a pelt of golden hair unlike any other animal in the world. Jason believed that by possessing the fleece from the golden ram, he could help his father Aeson return to the throne of Thessaly. In modern times, scientists have struggled to figure out what exactly the golden fleece symbolized in this ancient myth. Some scholars believe the golden fleece was nothing but one part of a fantasy. However, Liz Leaflor, an expert in ancient myths, said it was almost certainly rooted in reality. And now, thanks to scientists from the Ilya State University in Georgia, we know that there was in fact a journey to the kingdom of Colchis about 3,500 years ago. Between 2002 and 2010, the scientists carried out excavations all along the coast of the Black Sea, where Jason supposedly made his journey. At the time, there was a large coastal city here that boasted an incredible wealth of gold. Excavations have shown that the kingdom mined their gold from the local rivers using a sheepskin gold mining technique. The locals use real sheepskin to filter the gold from the rivers. This technique and the hunt for gold was probably the very real motivation for Jason's journey. Fossil Medicine When ancient people came across fossils, they didn't know what kind of beast they belonged to. To somebody living 2,000 years ago or beyond, they would have connected the fossils of dinosaurs and other prehistoric monsters to legendary creatures. And if not legendary creatures, then demons, gods, or anything else from their local mythology. To the ancient people all over the world, fossils represented extinct beasts like dragons, giants, and deities who walked among mortals. But instead of revering these mysterious bones, they made up stories about the special powers hidden inside of them. Many ancient cultures around the world believed that the bones of these dead deities and creatures had the power to restore youth, make you more vigorous in the bedroom, grant eternal life, and cure any kind of ailment. It was this bizarre belief that spawned a strange medicinal trend. There are way too many examples to talk about, so let's focus on the Native American tribes of the Comanche. The Comanche, whenever they discovered fossils, crushed the fossils into a very fine powder and then brewed the powder with potent herbal ingredients. They would create a kind of fossil tonic, then use that tonic to treat everything from sprains to fractures. Some even drank the formula as a dietary supplement. They believed fossils belonged to the bones of prehistoric ogres that they called Mu Pits, huge beings who had walked across North America before gradually going extinct. The Ancient Vampire Slayers In 2022, a mysterious vampire slaying kit was sold by Hansen's auctioneers for the small price of about $20,000. The kit was owned by a British aristocrat who thought it would be fun to put it up for sale. But nobody had expected that the vampire killing tools would cause an international bidding war. People from France, the United States, and Canada were bidding on the bizarre artifacts. We don't know who finally purchased the item as their identity has been kept a secret. But according to the auctioneers, the vampire slaying kit is a very real artifact made in the 19th century. Inside of a small wooden box are the tools and holy objects which people less than 200 years ago believed could ward off vampires. These tools include things like crucifixes, a brass powder flask, a gothic bible, a small wooden mallet and a stake, rosary beads, and of course, holy water. The original owner of the kit was a man named Lord Haley, who had been the administrator of British India and the governor of Punjab from between 1924 and 1928. We're not sure why he had a kit used for killing vampires, whether it was because of legitimate fear or simply fascination. 
but we do know that Lord Haley was part of a vague group known as the House of Lords. The organization's members were only the wealthiest aristocrats of the day. Maybe these aristocrats were secretly vampire hunters, or maybe they were just eccentric collectors of all things occult. The Quina Metzen When the Spanish invaded Mexico in the 16th century, they heard many strange stories from the indigenous inhabitants. Folklore from the Aztec, the Maya, Olmec, the Zapotec, it was all entwined with the populations of Mexico. Stories have been circulating for thousands of years between different societies, and the Spanish wrote it all down in their Chronicles of Conquest. One of the more bizarre tales weaved in the 1500s was that of the Kinametsin. These were described as semi-giants, a group of extraordinarily large human-like beings sculpted by the gods. The Kinametsin were killed off during a great catastrophe when the mountainous area of Tlaxcala was completely flooded. The flood devastated the giant's home, and then they were killed by a mysterious group of merchants who pushed inland from the coast around the year 200 BC. Here's where the story gets unbelievable. Historians believe that in the year 200 BC, the Olmec Xicalanca culture arrived in the mountains of Tlaxcala. They had come from somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico, but nobody is really sure where. Some historians have suggested that when they met the people living in Tlaxcala, the Olmec Xicalanca wiped them out and then stole their land. This was 1500 years before the Spanish did the same thing. There hasn't been any physical proof found that a small tribe of giants really did live here, but the legends told in the 1500s do match up almost perfectly with real historical events. The Devil's Dyke and the Lost City of Troy There is a mysterious dyke near Cambridge in England. It's called the Devil's Dyke, and it emerges from the ground as a kind of hump, long and smooth and going for nearly eight miles in a straight line. Most historians agree the enormous bank and ditch were probably built by the Anglo-Saxons, likely used as some kind of defensive barrier. But then other researchers say the dike was really part of the ancient city of Troy, which they suggest was in England and not in Turkey. This is a wild theory, especially seeing as almost every mainstream archaeologist agrees Troy was in the Mediterranean. This theory states that the city of Troy from Greek myth was on the Gog Magog Hills near Cambridge, and the Devil's Dyke was a huge fortification rampart built of mud and earth by the Greek invaders. The dyke's position would have made sense as a place to stop the chariots and horses from breaking through to a coastal invasion force. Unfortunately, it's impossible to say if any of this is true. The dyke was definitely used as a fortified wall, but nobody truly knows who built it. We also don't think that the mythical city of Troy stood where Cambridge stands today, 3,200 years ago in 1200 BC. The Secret Alchemist Tycho Brahe was a secret alchemist and renaissance scientist who dabbled in astronomy, the unusual, and had a bizarre fixation with gold. He was also wildly wealthy, and he was an unusual eccentric who lived a mysterious life. He even owned a pet moose. He was born in 1546 and is known today for taking the first detailed measurement of Mars' orbit. He was indeed a brilliant scientist, but couldn't escape the oddities of the European Renaissance. For example, Tycho Brahe lost his nose in a duel and then wore a fake one on his face. He also hired an assistant named Jep because he suffered from dwarfism, and Tycho believed he had supernatural clairvoyant abilities. He was so rich he owned roughly 1% of Denmark, his native country. And then there was the alchemy. According to Sheila J. Rabin from Oxford Bibliographies, alchemy was the peak of scientific endeavor in the 16th century. In 1575, Tycho was busy performing experiments, but nobody knows what kind of experiments he was doing. When his corpse was exhumed in the year 1901, 300 years after his death, scientists analyzed his hair. It was found that Tycho had a gold content 100 times higher than a normal person in his hair. This would mean that during the last two months of his life, he was excessively exposed to gold. We don't know what he was doing in his renaissance laboratory, but it definitely had something to do with gold. Considering his obsession with alchemy, he may have been trying to figure out how to replicate gold by means of magic. Supernatural Ley Lines 
Archaeologist Alfred Watkins made a strange discovery in 1921. He realized that many ancient sites across the globe are peculiarly aligned. Whether this site was made by human hands or entirely natural, they all seem to be set in a straight line. By connecting all of these magnificent sites, Alfred surmised that they had all been built on energetic channels underneath the planet's surface. He called these channels ley lines and was the first to suggest that such avenues of energy were required for opening the door to the supernatural. The concept itself is easy. Ley lines crisscross the globe and carry supernatural energy from another dimension. Ancient people could sense that energy, feel it like the heat of the sun on their backs, and so they made their monuments on it. The pyramids of Giza, Chichen Itza, and even Stonehenge. And that's only the beginning. Skellig Michael, the mysterious island monastery off the coast of Ireland, is connected in a straight line to Mont Saint-Michel in France, Sacra di Saint-Michel in Italy, and Monastero di San Michele in Greece. There is a straight line of religious buildings, and every single one of them is named Michael, and nobody can explain why. This kind of thing repeats itself all over the globe. But why? Are ley lines real? Are they really moving energy across the globe? It's quite the mystery. The Terrible Pied Piper There is one forbidden piece of history that involves a man we've all heard of at least once. He's the Pied Piper, and his story was made immortal by the Grimm brothers in their book of children's fairy tales published in 1816. But his story goes back much further. The original legend is that the Pied Piper was hired to get rid of the rats plaguing the medieval German town of Hamelin. The rats were a major nuisance, they were spreading disease and the townsfolk had no idea how to get rid of them. So the Pied Piper came along with his magic pipe, played a tune that the rats couldn't resist, and lured them out of the city with his instrument's magical powers. But that's when things turned dark. He asked the citizens of Hamelin to pay him for his service. They refused. And so he went back to town and used the power of his musical pipe to lure away their children. Once he was gone with all of their kids, who knows what kind of horrible things he did to them? What's interesting is that there are a lot of theories about who the Pied Piper really was. While most people will tell you it was a simple fairy tale, it may have very much been real. First of all, Hamelin was devastated by the plague, which was carried by rats. Second, the original record of the Pied Piper doesn't mention rats whatsoever. The oldest written account of the Pied Piper is from 1284. A man supposedly came into town and stole 130 children and fled. The Pied Piper may have been a kidnapper of kids, not a catcher of rats. Royal Witches England has a long history of magic. Witchcraft, sorcery, and necromancy have been prevalent for nearly a thousand years. But in truth, pagan witchcraft almost certainly goes back even further. In the 15th century, the English monarchy was allegedly infiltrated by women practicing magic. King Henry IV's second wife, Joan of Navarre, who lived between 1370 and 1437, was accused of using evil magic. She allegedly tried to use her magic to murder her stepson, Henry V. So Joan was locked up in Leeds Castle for years, until finally released by Henry V after he forgave her on his deathbed. Several decades later, her stepdaughter-in-law, Eleanor Cobham, the Duchess of Gloucester, was accused of using her own evil magic to kill yet another son of Henry, King Henry VI. There were so many Henrys at the time, it must have been difficult even for them to keep track of who was who. It was said that Eleanor was a practitioner of necromancy and that she had been trying to use demonic forces to kill Henry VI. She was convicted and imprisoned in Beaumaris, a remote Welsh castle until she died. While the kings were able to convince the population that these women were witches, historians believe they probably just said that as justification to get rid of unwanted female companions. The Moon Mission of 1640 Apollo 11 journeyed to the moon in 1969, but it was hardly the first attempt. Over 300 years earlier in the 17th century, Dr. John Wilkins tried to organize his own moon landing during the English Civil War. During the 17th century, there was a huge boom in scientific interests and exploration. John Wilkins was inspired by explorers like Columbus and Magellan. He believed that if they could reach the New World by boat, 
he too could reach the moon hovering up in the sky. He didn't even think it would be that far away. According to historian Dr. Alan Chapman, John Wilkins was riding an unprecedented wave of scientific advancement. In 1638, Wilkins wrote a book claiming the moon was inhabited by a group of people named the Selenites and that it would be possible to trade with them, just like trading with the Native Americans in North America. So the doctor tried to build a flying machine. It was to be a chariot that he could ride all the way into the sky and to the moon. He experimented with building flying machines at Wadham College in Oxford in 1654, but by the 1660s, it became pretty clear he didn't know what he was doing. He had gotten all kinds of money together, brought together the brightest scientific minds he could find, and then came to the harsh realization that he had no idea how to build a spaceship. Edinburgh's Volcano Castle Edinburgh Castle was built on the top of a volcano. The enormous structure sits on a high hill above the city of Edinburgh in Scotland. It is one of the oldest fortifications in Europe and has been used as a royal residence, a prison, a fortress, and a military garrison. Kings and queens have lived inside the walls of the castle, starting with David I in the 12th century. There may have been a fortification even older, but historians aren't sure about that. From between the 12th and 15th century, Edinburgh Castle was a residential structure for the ruling class. Whoever inhabited the castle also ruled all of Scotland. For this reason, the castle soon became the most besieged place in all of Britain. There was trouble in the 13th century when Edward I tried to steal the throne, and then Mary, Queen of Scots, took the castle in the 16th century. After Charles I was executed, the English took over the castle in 1650, and as soon as the English took it over, it was transitioned into a prison. Battles were continuously fought here until 1757. However, nowadays it's a tourist attraction overlooking the beautiful Scottish capital. But let's get back to that part about the volcano. The stone upon which the castle was built is named Castle Rock. Millions of years ago, the rock had been part of a wildly erupting volcano. But that volcano has since gone dormant, and the towering stone cliff is all that remains. It may not look like it from the ground, but Edinburgh Castle stands 433 feet above sea level. The Genoese Fortress The Genoese Fortress in Crimea is like something straight out of a medieval fairy tale. It's an extremely impressive fortification occupying 30 hectares of land, situated upon the ancient Krepostnaya Gora, or Fortress's Mountain. The fortress overlooks the countryside from its high vantage point. It's built upon the precipice of the mountain, with its stone walls and rampart directly on the edge of the abyss. Beneath the fortress is Sudox Bay, with its beautiful emerald waters. The fortress was built at a strategic point so that the soldiers could see any potential attack coming in from the bay, while also having a clear view of every nearby mountain pass. The first fortifications arose in the 6th century, built by the Byzantine Empire. But it wasn't until the Genoese period that the modern fortress was built, constructed between 1371 and 1469. The Genoese Republic was stationed in Italy, but had several colonies around the Mediterranean, including southern Crimea, Lesbos, and Monaco. The fortress was designed for maximum defense. It used the northern slopes of the mountain to its advantage, with a series of 14 towers connected by solid walls and gates. This was a wall of natural and man-made defense, the epitome of medieval Western architecture. Grand Singhi the Grand Singhi of Madagascar is an extraordinarily strange natural place that looks like it belongs either on a foreign planet or in a storybook. It's a forest of limestone needles, a place so dangerous that to explore it would mean almost certain death. The Grand Singhi is considered the largest stone forest in the world. There are two geological formations within the Singhi de Bemaraha National Park, but both are equally as dangerous. The only way to reach the forest is by crossing the island of Madagascar, which itself is no easy task. The roads are barely there, and you can easily grow lost and starve in the dense forests. But inside the Grand Singhi, it's even more dangerous. The whole place is made up of extremely sharp limestone. The tall rock formations are so sharp, 
weathered by over 200 million years of elements, that one wrong step could be fatal. Just touching the wrong rock can wind up cutting your fingers off, and falling would most likely mean certain death. The prongs of limestone in the forest are so sharp they can impale people. The forest of stone is extremely vast. It stretches 375,000 acres, with some of the rock formations climbing to 2,600 feet. NASA says the Singhi Forest began to form when layers of calcite at the bottom of a lagoon formed an extremely thick bed of limestone. It was almost like a slab of concrete. Then, over hundreds of millions of years, the limestone was carved out by annual monsoon rains to form rocky towers of sharp, dangerous daggers. Trying to climb the Singhi Forest is like trying to climb a mountain of swords. Neuschwanstein Castle Neuschwanstein Castle is the definition of a fairy tale castle come to life. There isn't anywhere else in the world that looks more like an illustration from a fairy tale than Neuschwanstein Castle in Germany. It has tall towers, turrets, a real throne hall, and more rooms than you could ever need. While the castle is certainly magical, its history is a little more tragic. The castle was commissioned by King Ludwig II of Bavaria in 1868. The king had recently lost some major battles, as two years earlier, Austria and Bavaria were conquered by Prussia. Ludwig began to decline mentally. He wished nothing more than to seclude himself in his own private fantasy world. Who can blame him? This included building Neuschwanstein Castle. Even though he had lost his kingdom, King Ludwig hoped to live out his final days in his own realm where he still had some power. However, the king never lived to see the completion of his precious castle. He died in 1886, and the final towers weren't finished until 1892. Ever since its completion, the castle has been one of the most popular attractions in Germany. It's also one of the most visited castles in the entire world. The tallest tower reaches 213 feet, but it looks like a lot more considering the castle is perched on the edge of a mountain. It looks positively enormous. And yes, the castle was almost certainly the inspiration behind the castle in Disney's Cinderella, released back in 1950. It also looks a lot like Sleeping Beauty's fairy tale castle, the Pyramids of Xi'an. The Chinese city of Xi'an is the capital of the Shanxi province, with a history that dates back thousands of years. And while the city itself is more of an urban nightmare these days than anything out of a fairy tale, the countryside is a different story. Within 16 miles of the city are 38 pyramids that were built in memory of the great emperors of China. One of them is the mausoleum of the first Qin emperor, where the legendary terracotta army was found. The terracotta army is something straight out of a fairy tale. A subterranean legion of sentinels made from clay crafted to protect the emperor in the afterlife. But the truth is that there are far more pyramids throughout the region, creating a kind of mystical landscape of overgrown mounds covering over long-forgotten tombs. The pyramids are not quite as impressive these days as those in Egypt. Most of them aren't pointy or smooth, as they were built out of mud and earth and have since deflated into grassy mounds. Shirakawego The small village of Shirakawego looks like something from a Japanese fairy tale. The quaint wood and thatch houses in the village date back over 100 years. The houses were built in the traditional Gasho Zukuri architectural style, with sloped roofs meant to mimic the shape of two hands pressed together during a prayer. The houses almost look like temples, and the oldest among them is a place called the Kanda House. It was built over 160 years ago and has four stories of exceptionally preserved Japanese history. Everything inside the house is the exact same as it was almost two centuries ago. Visitors can see exactly how people lived in ancient Japan and can even walk around the fairy tale garden and pond outside. It's not one house in particular that gives Shirakawago its fairy tale status. In fact, it's the entire village. The place hasn't changed much since before electricity came to the region. The streets are narrow, originally designed for carts instead of cars. Each small farmhouse sits on its own square of land with traditional crop plots for growing rice and other food. Not to mention, the whole village is situated in a beautiful green valley with no sign of civilization in the rising green hills. And beyond, rising against the horizon, are the massive snow-covered mountains. Borgund Stave Church 
The Borgund Stave Church is right out of a medieval Norse fantasy. It was built just after the end of the Viking era in the year 1180 and was first dedicated to the Apostle Andrew. The church has been standing for nearly 1,000 years, but looks like it could have been built as recently as the 1970s. It's so well preserved that it's become a distinctive feature in Norway. People from all over the world flock to see the church, not only because it's in great shape, but because it truly is something spectacular to behold. The church was carved with expert skill, complete with carvings of dragons, Christian crosses, and sloped roofs like something out of a Tim Burton film. Technically, all the harsh angles, slopes, and points are part of the triple nave stave church style that was popular in the 12th and 13th centuries. Inside the church is even more impressive than on the outside. The medieval interior is almost untouched and unblemished by time, complete with the original wooden flooring and the benches along the walls. The altar is even built of stone, with a small baptismal font made from soapstone. It's a bizarre mixture of Viking styles with Christian overtones, such as the paintings of the Crucifixion, the Virgin Mary, and John the Baptist. The Borgen Stave Church is right beside the King's Road, a historic pathway considered the most beautiful road in all of Norway. It's the most idyllic and fairy tale like place you can walk in the whole country, steeped in Norwegian history. Molnoma Falls about 30 minutes from Portland is a natural splendor straight from a scene in a storybook. It's called Monoma Falls, and it looks like a place you might find unicorns drinking or water nymphs bathing. The falls send icy water cascading 611 feet straight down into a frothing pool. The beautifully enchanting place has an important part in Native American lore. Legend has it that Monoma Falls was made following a tragedy involving a young princess. Waisko folklore says the princess was the daughter of Chief Mulnoma and that she sacrificed herself to the Great Spirit by flinging herself from the top of the falls. Back then, the falls didn't have any water coming out of it. At the time, the local tribes were being ravaged by an unknown illness, one that was killing people with unbelievable speed. The local medicine man claimed the Great Spirit would continue to allow the disease to run rampant until he received a sacrifice. The Great Spirit, for whatever reason, requested the chief's daughter to be sacrificed to placate his whim. The chief would not allow it, but the daughter did it anyway by throwing herself off the cliff. According to legend, when the chief found her body at the bottom, he prayed so hard that water began to stream down from the top. Cefalu, Italy The small Italian town of Cefalu is something from a medieval fable. It's about an hour east of Palermo, situated at the very edge of a natural blue bay, and it's in the shadow of a small mountain. However, this small mountain is really just a huge chunk of granite, one the locals call La Roca. For such a tiny town, Cefalu is not short on things to do. It has its own sandy beaches, the streets date back to the medieval days, and there are still traditional shops and restaurants. It even has a unique Norman cathedral inspired by the Normans of France and England centuries ago. The Norman cathedral makes a little more sense when we look at the ancient history of the town. The town itself may date back thousands of years to the ancient Greeks, but the modern fairy tale village is more recent. It was built by the order of the Norman king Roger II. Construction of the great cathedral began in 1131, a mixture between Norman, Roman, and Sicilian styles. The king loved his medieval city so much that he set up residence besides a natural spring running through the town. The old king's house is now a building that hosts art exhibitions. Hohenzollern Castle Hohenzollern Castle is the ancient ancestral seat for the Prussian kings of Hohenzollern. It began as a small mountain fortress in the early 11th century. It got caught in multiple battles over the years and was finally destroyed once and for all in 1423. The free imperial cities of Swabia, a region of southwestern Germany, rose up against the imperial house of Hohenzollern. They laid siege to the castle for 10 months and then tore it down piece by piece. A second castle was built in 1454 that was bigger, sturdier, and more robust. But over the next 300 years, there were no more sieges. The castle lost its strategic importance and fell into disuse. 
it eventually crumbled into pieces, and for the second time, Hohenzollern Castle was destroyed. But the line of the Prussian kings was far from gone. In 1846, a third castle was built at the exact same spot by King Frederick William IV of Prussia of the Hohenzollern dynasty. He built a stunning fairy tale castle straight from a Walt Disney movie for no other reason than that he wanted to. The castle was made as a kind of family memorial, a testament to the lasting bloodline of the Prussian princes. The castle is enormous, with 140 rooms, an extensive library, a bedchamber fit for a king, and a special queen's room called the Blue Salon. The ceilings are covered with gold, the hallways are adorned with portraits of Prussian royalty, and the castle even has its own brewery. But even after it was initially finished in 1867, no member of the Hohenzollern family ever resided inside the castle. It was all just for show. Fan Jingshan Temple Mount Fan Jingshan in China's Gizhou province is one of the most remote places in the entire world. It's also one of the most magical. The mountain is the highest peak in the Wuling Mountains of southeastern China, at an elevation of 8,430 feet. But it's not the peak itself that makes this such a remarkable place, but rather the Buddhist temple at the top that looks like something you typically only see in a fantasy movie or a dream. Perched at the very top of the mountain, what the locals call Red Cloud Golden Peak, is the unbelievable Fan Jingshan Temple. The peak is divided by a huge crevice, looking like two stony fingers piercing the sky. And on the tip of each finger is a temple, with a small bridge connecting them over a massive drop to certain death. There is the Temple of the Buddha and the Temple of Maitreya, one for worshipping the present and the other for the future. The temples were built about 500 years ago during the Ming Dynasty. They were built using the strongest iron tiles to protect them from the furious winds at such a high elevation. The view from the top is spectacular, with sweeping panoramas of the remote mountains on every side. The only way to get there is by climbing thousands of stairs up the steep cliffs. The whole place is usually covered in a sea of mist and clouds. You can only see into the distance on extremely clear days. Otherwise, you're pretty much standing inside of the clouds themselves. Rainbow Reef Fiji is one of the most remote islands in the world, over 2,700 miles from Hawaii. It makes sense then that Fiji is home to one of the most secluded coral reefs ever discovered. It's called the Rainbow Reef, and it was found by none other than Jacques Cousteau. The water here is a beautiful turquoise. There are over 230 types of hard and soft coral, and at least 1,200 species of exotic fish. It's considered the best place to dive in the world for those interested in seeing a pristine paradise of marine life. One of the reasons it's so clean and pristine is its remoteness, as it's nearly impossible for an average person to fly to the middle of the ocean just to go diving. Rainbow Reef has yet to be spoiled by mass tourism and pollution. One of the greatest features of the Rainbow Reef is the Great White Wall. It's a solid wall of soft coral stretching beneath the surface of the turquoise waters over 90 feet. The current here is so strong that you can be swept off into the ocean and never seen again. But it's almost worth the risk just to witness the beauty. The Purple Russian Volcano Deep in the Russian wilderness, far from any city and tourist cameras, there is a volcano that turns the sky purple. The volcano erupted in June of 2019 and spewed sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. According to researchers from the University of Colorado, the sulfur dioxide created small particles of aerosols, which scattered sunlight sifting through the atmosphere to birth beautiful hues of purple during the sunrise and sunset. The volcano is called Reykoke, and it can be found on the Kuril Island chain in the remote wasteland of the Kamchatka Peninsula. When it erupted in 2019, it released steam and gas over 1.2 miles into the air. It was its first eruption since 1924, and because of its isolated location, there was very little threat to any airplanes or humans. But its volcanic ash plume did reach 8 miles high, well into the stratosphere. While most people in North America have no idea what was happening, those living in northern Russia were given a spectacular purple sunset, the likes of which they'll probably never see again in their lifetimes. But here's one more important fact. 
While the aerosol in the atmosphere painted beautiful plum sunsets this time, too much of that same aerosol can be dangerous. In 1815, Mount Tambora in Indonesia filled the atmosphere with so many aerosols that it caused global crop failure, famine, and strife. Batanes Batanes is the most remote island region in all the Philippines. Considering the Philippines is nothing but a network of islands, that's really saying something. The islands of Batanes are technically closer to Taiwan than the rest of the island country. But here's what's really interesting about Batanes, which by the way is the name of the province, not of any of the islands. The islands don't even look like the rest of the Philippines. Forget about white sandy beaches and swaying palm trees, the Batanes Islands look a lot more like the Scottish Highlands. There are emerald hills dotted with quiet cattle and roaming sheep, and quaint towns built out of stone like early English villages. Paths are lined with flowers, there are craggy cliffs where the sea thrashes against their bulks, and even lighthouses standing on chunks of rock just waiting to fall over. It's a kind of magical place that brings to mind visions of Viking exploration more than backpackers and banana plantations. One of the most unique aspects of the islands is that they produce just enough food to feed their own population. There is a complete absence of markets, with the locals working only for themselves and to take care of the community. They fish just enough to feed themselves, don't worry about making any money, and live almost entirely off the land. Archime. Archime is a remote archaeological site in Russia that dates back to roughly 2050 BC. Researchers believe it was the Sintashta culture who built this place at the foot of the Ural Mountains, quite near to the borderlands of Kazakhstan, where the land swells in green waves of tiny hills. The site was first found in 1987, but it's hardly been studied. The Sintashta culture were an early group of Indo-Iranians before they split into different factions and migrated throughout the region. That means the Sintashta culture were the original Persians. They migrated 4,000 years ago from southern Russia into Central Asia and from there made their way into Persia, India, and other parts of Eurasia. But what exactly was the site used for? Archaeologists believe it was a megalithic stronghold. They have found evidence of over 60 dwellings, furnaces used for smelting metal, circular streets that had been paved with wood, and even drainage gutters to help with waste management and the collection of water. This was a major city that utilized advanced technologies. Scholars have identified Archim as one of the very first planned cities, one occupied by a society with a highly developed social structure. There would have been local leaders and some kind of spiritual activity, but nobody's sure what religious beliefs they held. We're also not sure why the city was abandoned. It could have had something to do with an invasion. And it also could have been that the Sintashta culture migrated south, looking for more prosperous lands. Penny Rock Penny Rock is a bizarre state attraction in the south of Pennsylvania, located in Salt Spring State Park. It's far from any of the main roads, and as of 2021, completely unreachable. There was an issue with the bridge leading to it, and it's unclear whether the bridge has been fixed yet. Salt Springs State Park is a pretty fascinating place. It's filled with spectacular waterfalls and beautiful hiking trails. And of course, there is also the Salt Springs. The Native American Onondaga people used the area for mining salt for trade with other groups many hundreds of years ago. One of the springs in the park is the start for the Hemlock Trail, which leads through a deep forest of tall hemlock trees over 300 years old and rooted inside of this dark and slightly spooky grove is a gigantic boulder. This is Penny Rock, and for some totally bizarre reason, the boulder is covered in pennies. For decades, visitors have been jamming and pounding pennies into grooves and crevices on the boulder. The myth is that by leaving your penny smashed into the rock, you will gain good fortune. And by prying a penny out of the rock, you can give yourself a lifetime of bad luck. The Lost Maya the ruins of a gigantic Maya city were recently found in a lonely part of the jungle in southeast Mexico. Archaeologists found broken pyramids, shattered plazas, and the remains of brick walls that had once been marvelous palaces. But to be honest, the ruins are extremely easy to miss. The whole place is covered in thick vegetation, almost completely reabsorbed by the jungle. A few more years and the stone will decay completely. 
and there won't be a single trace left of the great civilization that once lived here. The ruins were found deep in the jungle near Campeche on Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. This is a place already littered with ancient Maya cities and mysterious burial sites. The new city has been named Chactún, and it was occupied around the year 600 AD up until the collapse of the Maya in 900. According to archaeologist Ivan Sprach from Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History, the city is one of the largest sites in the central lowlands, comparable in size and magnitude to cities like El Palmar and Nazcan. It was almost definitely a major center for commerce and culture. One of the pyramids was so big that when it was finished over a thousand years ago, it stood 75 feet tall. Bugs on the beach On an extremely remote island beach, scientists have discovered a deadly hospital superbug. It's the first time researchers have seen this particular organism in the wild. It's called Candida auris, and it mysteriously appeared in hospitals all over the globe about a year ago. According to Dr. Arturo Casadeval at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore, the organism is a complete medical mystery. But now that they have discovered its natural habitat on a random stretch of beach, scientists are hoping to put together the puzzle and figure out the origin of the superbug. If you're a little confused, I'll try to explain. The superbug is a fungus, and it was first found in 2009 in Japan. From there, it spread across the globe and caused bloodstream infections in patients. It's an absolute nightmare of an infection, and nobody knows how it reached so many hospitals around the world. We also don't know why it lives on the beach. It was discovered by medical mycologist Dr. Anuradha Chowdhury in the Andaman Islands, which is a remote tropical archipelago found off the coast of India. It's not a popular tourist destination. It's about as tropical and remote as you can get, and the closest a person can be to actually being stranded on a deserted island. You just better hope you don't get sick while on one of these islands, since the sand is crawling with microscopic superbugs. Lost Bhutan In the remote and isolated mountains of Bhutan, archaeologists came across a ruined zong from the 16th century. This was a unique type of architectural building specific to Bhutan and Tibet, something like a fortified Buddhist monastery. There are dozens and even hundreds of these things scattered across Tibet and Bhutan, but most have been reduced to ruins. This one is no exception with very few structural walls still standing, and most of the site nothing but scattered bricks and chunks of rock. It was likely a gigantic fortress starting around 1550 and thrived up until the 1700s. It would have resembled a mix between a traditional Buddhist temple and a medieval castle. Researchers believe that Song was built by Chokor Deb, the local ruler of the Chakor To Valley. This was an ancient passage leading between Bhutan and Tibet. It would have been from this fortification that a huge garrison of over 2,000 men was stationed to protect Bhutan from invasion, as well as to regulate any trade moving in and out of their territory. The Majorville Medicine Wheel In the Canadian province of Alberta, there is an ancient monument called the Majorville Medicine Wheel, or the Iniskim Umapi. It was built over 4,500 years ago, and it's almost impossible to get to. The only way to reach this long-lost remnant of Native American culture is by driving a 4x4 vehicle into the very heart of the prairies, down an old dirt track that looks like it's only been used by donkeys and merchant caravans. There is no civilization to speak of out here, and nothing but the wind, the grass, and the cacti. To the untrained eye, the medicine wheel doesn't even look like anything. If you were to pass by here not knowing what it was, you would just think it was strange that a large pile of rocks was piled up in the middle of the unending field. But in truth, these stones were added here thousands of years before Europeans ever made it to the shores of North America. It's one of the oldest known structures in Canada, a ruined cairn surrounded by a circle of 28 spokes. Historians say medicine wheels were used by different Native American tribes for a variety of reasons, primarily for health and healing. Some medicine wheels were painted, some were made by piling rocks together, and others were carved into the dirt. The Majorville medicine wheel was made by the ancestors of the Blackfoot Nation and is only one of about 70 still remaining in North America. This is one of only three built from mounds of stones. 
To this very day, the Majorville Medicine Wheel is considered a sacred place by the Native Americans in Alberta. Visiting the hill where the stones are is like a sacred pilgrimage and a spiritual journey even to non-Native Americans as they delve deep into the ancient grasslands of northern Canada. Thanks for watching! Which of these remote places would you love to visit for yourself? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. See you soon! Bye!